Good morning, all. It would be time for greetings or an announcements. Okay, Sister uh, Julie Kale sends her greetings. Thank you, Sister Danielle. Okay, greetings from uh, Steve Terzik and Ida. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brother Robert. Take your greetings wherever you go. Um, Brother Robert and Sister Runkets are going to be in Texas, Lord willing, next month or so, month May. Um, Lord be with you. Amen. Greetings from Colorado Springs. Good to have you back, Christina. Yes, Danka. Okay, Sister Danka relays the message from Brother Stevie. Uh, 33 days for Pine Valley. And if you haven't registered for Pine Valley, uh, now is the time to do so. Uh, May the 1st, uh, the uh, fees go up and you're a late register if you do pass then. Okay, so Sister Mariana, thank you very much. Her mother sends greetings. Uh, Cornell is out of the hospital. He's back home. He says he feels amazing. Okay, that's good, considering all he's been through. So, uh, greetings back home. Amazing what a man can do in the hospital. Yes. Yes, Brother Sam. Uh, Mary, Mary, uh, Mary, 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 I saw the pictures. Campfires and... Yes, and s'mores, it must have been good. Very good. Okay. Uh, you just you give, give the summary now, yes. At first it was right there, but then as they discovered more and more rot, they needed to replace more and more. Okay. Okay. Okay, so if you go out, if you go out in the courtyard, you, you look up, most of us don't, but if you look up, you'll see that some of the tiles are off, but all the work uh, to, for waterproofing has been done. Uh, they had to replace rotten wood all the way up to the peak, it seems, and it's been doing that for years and years, so it's good to have that done, and so um, thank you for that update, Brother Sam. Yeah. So it's better than new. Yes. Okay. Th thank you. Other greetings or announcements? Okay. So if you are bringing desserts, bring two. If you're bringing two, label one for lunch, one for dinner, so it's plain. Uh, this is for baptism. Uh, the schedule. So let me let me just read through the schedule. Brother Dushka has set up and sent out to the churches. 9.30 a.m. is testimonies. That's uh, for members only. 11 a.m. is baptism service for all. Uh, 12.30 p.m., so that's shifted already, a half hour, is lunch. 2.30 p.m., afternoon services for members only. Uh, 5 p.m. is dinner. 6 p.m. is general singing. I, I do believe we are planning to put up tarps, uh, Harps. Uh, the shelter in the patio. Um, 
We also need a volunteer to lead Bible discussion with the non-members during that afternoon time. So uh, if you're so inspired, talk to Brother Dushko. Uh, we need to have a volunteer to lead a Bible discussion for non-members in the afternoon uh, for that afternoon services for members only. Um, any other greetings or announcements? I have a few more here. Jonathan. And where is that? Or is it an email? Balboa. Okay, so there will be a bonfire for CFG on that evening before. Choir today at 1245. Uh, time is short, so be there. Um, greetings from Brother Irwin Webble in Mansfield. Um, of course, all the normal prayer requests are in our weekly bulletin. And... Uh, at the end of service, of course, as the brother would bring a prayer, remember to include the afternoon meal. We'll turn it over to Brother Bishko. Thank you. I just uh, thought before I begin, uh, just uh, wanted to share with you, I'm thankful to be back a little bit under the weather, so uh, appreciate your prayers, <coughs> the gifts you receive when you travel. But it's good to be back. Uh, so I bring you greetings from Syracuse, New York, where uh, the meeting took place the previous weekend, Friday and Saturday. Uh, the uh, Syracuse Church hosted us. It is unfortunate, Brother Bob Freund Sr. joined us Friday, uh, which is tradition when we have a meeting. If there are retired elders in the area, they would typically join us for part of the meeting just to say hello. And, you know, he's 91 and, you know, doing fairly well for his age, but he suffered some pain during lunch and we thought it was a heart attack. So there was an ambulance and and paramedics and all that stuff, and we had a prayer meeting for him. Uh, ended up being okay in the hospital in ICU, but it just, you know, uh, getting older. He had a tear in the aorta and an aneurysm nearby, so they can't operate. Uh, he's out of the hospital, being monitored, uh, but it's just as Lord gives the days, so we can just continue to uplift the Freund family, particularly Bob Sr. So that's the update on that part. I uh, uh, managed to get Saturday late to uh, back to Canada and, and spend Sunday in Richmond Hill uh, with our family and uh, the church sends greetings, especially Ronnie and Jenny. It was nice to see them and the grandkids. And now we're back uh, uh, busily getting ready for the baptism. Regarding the children and next Sunday, uh, Eric's going to be coordinating with a few people during the week. He, him and Megan are, are talking about that and talking to Sam. And then we're going to plan and figure out what to do uh, typically we have morning since we're going to be starting at 9 30 already uh and that's for members only so just so you know uh if you have questions about that uh being a baptism weekend uh it is always a uh, proper that for me to remind us all of the planning and requirements spiritual planning for the communion that we will share in the afternoon again that's for members only following the uh laying out of the hand services so the communion will be served lord willing uh, so also if there are any special needs regarding the communion you need to let me know and then we plan according again let us be in prayer uh, we expect you know relatively a full house and as we have uh, uh, you know fewer in number here in the church also a lot of responsibilities are being overlapped so i appreciate all your prayerful support and the physical support as we plan the coming weekend. Uh, it should be a beautiful day uh, in the 80s, so uh, wonderful weather, so thank God for that. The rain is over. Uh, Brother Dave and Brother Tim uh, Munther are in San Diego, and they had that mentorship uh, seminar uh, after, the, uh, after lunch, I think, and uh, Daniel and Gabby are in, in uh, South Bay, as I've communicated uh, uh, through emails with a lot of, lot of you as I came back. Okay, so that's conclusion of the announcements. And so at this time, uh, we transition in, into morning worship service. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just um, thankful that we could be here in this uh, thy house of worship. We ask a special prayer, Lord, as we would look into thy word, especially the words that are perhaps more challenging to appreciate and understand, and we ask for thy wisdom and thy 
Spirit's guidance as we look into thy word, meditate and expound on it, Lord, that we would find a blessing and encouragement through it. We give thee the honor and glory and praise for assembling us together here, for giving us the place that we can worship together and just allowing us so we can jointly uh, share in a fellowship uh, and be in thy presence. Again, ask a special blessing upon this morning's message that in Jesus' name, amen. A few Sundays ago, I initiated the chapter six of the Revelation. A few of you that were here in the church. Afternoon service is really not a, a perfect time to start Revelation six. So as I've shared with you that um, I will start, but I will probably go on back and refresh. So this morning is that opportunity, <clears throat> um, provided my voice doesn't fail me. And so we will go and read first eight verses of chapter six of the book of Revelation. And I will probably reiterate some of the comments I already made, but that's all good because you will uh, then... Uh, retain more understanding hopefully and at least remember a little bit more and then we'll see how far lord can uh, carry us so that we can continue with this chapter in the future so chapter six uh, i'm going to read first eight verses and i saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and i heard as it were the noise of thunder one of the four beasts saying come and see and I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on, on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth, conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth that they should kill one another and there was given unto him a great sword and when he had opened the third seal I heard the third beast say come and see and behold and lo a black horse and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see thou heard not the oil and the wine and when he had opened the fourth seal I heard the voice of the fourth beast say come and see and I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed or that word hell also could be uh let me just see, Hades, uh, Gehenna Hades, hell. So those are all the similar uh, words used. And the hell followed him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. So that's the end of verse 8. Um, again, just a couple of things as we started on this journey, believe it or not, over a year ago, I shared with you that there are traditionally four different views when it comes to interpretation of, of, of the uh, end times, the eschatology as, as we uh, 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 view it. I don't have, I think it would just take us a lot more time uh, and with the frequency of preaching, uh, opportunity to really be going into every uh, aspect of different views but just at least understand that there are different views and very notable scholars and biblical scholars uh, vary on, on, on the interpretation of the, of, of the end times and particularly the book of Revelation so God for some reason has left us a little bit to uh, search and seek and study and pray but the critical elements Christ wins at the end is what the message is all about the revelation because otherwise we can get tangled up in, into this so personally I've shared with you I'm going to be following uh, the path that I believe that the millennial kingdom is the actual physical uh, 1000 year kingdom and I know there are plenty of those that don't accept that that's a really physical and uh, the fact that these events starting you know from chapter 4 are more uh, events of the future. That's just at least my understanding. So 
at least you can wrap your mind around those things as I go forward. Otherwise, another advice when you study the book of Revelation, if you have a certain uh, view on that revelation, it is not a good to be bouncing back and forth. Uh, for this chapter, you think it's, it's this interpretation. The next chapter, you take a futuristic. Uh, then the following chapter, you're thinking about a preterist. It will just create a lot of confusion. So in, in a sense, it makes sense to follow one train of thought, what it makes, you know, where it makes sense. There's a lot of symbolism, but not everything is symbolic. There's a lot of symbolism. And the reason symbols are used, and I believe that God is given to John, because symbol can apply to every generation through, through over the thousands of years, verses of something specific. It is by God's grace that we search and seek to understand what things are symbolic and what, what things are real. And even that, you know, we may have a difference of opinion. So, so that's the preamble. So I thought at least to repeat a few of the comments so we saw chapter 4 is the throne of God. The whole focus of chapter 4 was giving God the glory for creation. Even though we know that by Christ and through Christ and for Christ, all things were created, he was the instrument of creation. But God is the creator. God is the originator of, 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 of uh, envisioning of, of things. So he is given the glory as the creator. In chapter 5, we see uh, the Lamb of uh, God, and he's called, you know, we worship the Redeemer. He's identified as the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, and the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ the Lord. So that's just the introduction to the kind of a, some visual uh, sense of what the throne of God or that presence in the third heaven looks like. So some of the hef- helpful tips as, you, as we study this, and again, I'm going to be repeating a few points that I already made a few weeks ago uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, the events are not always recorded in chronological order. For example, we're studying in chapter 6 here, but a little bit later we're going to be studying about two witnesses in chapter 11. That's way down. But in essence, in my understanding of that, and I will clarify when we get there, I believe that they are in the first three and a half years of, the, of, the, of this period. It's just they're recorded, their presence and activities recorded much later. So it's not always taken in a chronological order. Sometimes things are overlapping, and sometimes we get a view of the whole thing maybe. So, so it's not, not, not something that's just very easily to, uh, easy to follow and, 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 and consider that. According to Daniel 9, 24 through 27, uh, this is what it reads. And this is, he speaks, Daniel was given this, uh, you know, explanation. If you remember, as 70 year of captivity in Babylon was about to be over, as he read in the book of Jeremiah, he was alive at the end of 70 year in Babylon. He was praying to God, now these, you know, his promises need to come true, and that is their return back to Israel. But God gave him a vision, an explanation of the history of Israel going forward. And he explains that, that seven years is assigned to Israel in God's prophetic calendar, this, this, this seventh you know, year. So we see that in uh, uh, Daniel 9, 24 through 27, it reads like this. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the over spreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and the d- determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Basically, Daniel is given uh, an explanation of the history of his people, Israel, of that it's a, a 77 year period. And that the last seven year period, the 70th week, is what we believe is what, what I believe is this. Uh, chapters going from four on setting it up to the end that's the explanation of until about 19 and then we go into the into the future so i believe that 70th week a seven year period a hepta i think in in hebrew is what what this is all about so this is known as the 70th week of daniel in my understanding the word church or churches ecclesia is not mentioned from chapter on until the end of 
of the book, which is about chapter 22. That doesn't mean, you know, some people take that statement because church is not mentioned that church is raptured right before this 70th week begins. That's not enough proof in my mind, but just so you understand where some of the thinking is, is coming and maybe it's being reflected. But the church is not mentioned. Saints are mentioned, but the church is not mentioned. So there's no reference to that. Um, so we know that there are several views on timing of the rapture, if you support the idea that the scripture explains that there will be a rapture. There's several thoughts on when the rapture will take place. And that, again, overlays the complexity of the whole, uh, you know, of whole understanding of, of it. But that's the beauty of study. The seven-year year period is never mentioned in the book of Revelation. So we're just inferring from the Daniel 9 that this is that 70th week because 1260 days and 42 months are mentioned as separate uh, quantities of time or periods of time. And these are prophetic calendar days. You know, we know now we have 365 day calendar. So we can see and deduct that there, the scripture does speak of the 42 months and, or 30 uh, 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 or, or 1260 days, which are the three and a half years of prophetic years. But it doesn't say as a seven year period. Just again, some points of clarification. It appears that just prior to or at the very beginning of this seven year period, the temple in Jerusalem will be rebuilt with some of the Old Testament sacrifices in place. Hopefully we're going to touch on that as we go forward uh, a little bit more about it. I can't say that I have perfect understanding of that, uh, but that's, it, it appears, because how else would the Antichrist be able to desecrate the temple? So temple has to exist sacrifices some form of sacrifice has to be established and then he can uh, he can uh, desecrate also I believe the first three and a half years of this period is what Christ refers in Matthew 24 as the beginning of sorrow or the birth pains uh, let me explain to you again my rationale my thinking we're, we're talking about the scroll that Christ took out of the hand of God some People call it a, a, a deed to the earth. In other words, Adam has forfeited his right to this planet, to this earth as God has given it to. And Satan took over as the prince of the air. But now Christ is taking this over. And in it is really an explanation of all the things that, that need to take place. Now, if this was a scroll and it has seven seals, the way I'm thinking of why I kind of support that idea that these are just the a birth pains, this is just the beginning, is because all seven seals have to be really opened up before you can see the trumpets and the bowls of the vials. So there are things that are happening with each seal that is being opened, but that in itself, I don't think is the actual great tribulation. Again, that's just you know my, my rationale of explaining uh, the scripture. So the events taking place in the first three and a half year period appeared to be more of a natural disaster type, but perhaps more intensified. What do I mean with that? Wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilences, and so on and so forth. Those things have been part of the humanity ever since Christ left this earth and he has identified that those things will continue. But I, will, I believe that in this seven year period, in the first three and a half years, that will, that will just intensify. So, so if, as, you, as we're reading it, you can see that these are more of the natural type, where when we start getting into trumpets and, and, and vials or the bowls, they become more of a supernatural. That, again, it's my, my interpretation or understanding of the scripture. So the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel, the prophet uh, that uh, represents the midpoint of the seven-year period, uh, the disciples knew what that means because if, if you look in the history, Antiochus IV or the Epiphanes was the king of Syria. He captured Jerusalem in 167 BC and desecrated the temple by offering the sacrifice of a pig on an altar to Zeus. That, was, that happened 167 years BC. So the Jews really knew about this 
And we read, uh, and this is the abomination of desolation. So one type of Antichrist has already done this kind of a abomination. And so they understood what that means. In the book of Maccabees, we read a, that there was a 30-day cleansing period of the temple after that happened. I'm mentioning this to you just to understand. They understood what that means, number one, the disciples at that time. Number two, as we read Daniel and as we look into this book more and more, there will be a Daniel's claim that there is blessed is he who lives through 1290 days and 1335 days now up to that point all you're talking about is 1260 days but it seems like at the end there is an additional 30 days and 45 days that 30 days based on the book of maccabees and some uh, uh example of the old testament in, in the first kings could be for cleansing of the temple but that just i'm just kind of planting some seeds for you to search and and dig and follow, maybe we can jointly find, find the answer. So that may be the answers to some of the things that Daniel speaks at the end, at the end of the seven year period. Uh, what is the uh, significant about this? This is when the Antichrist breaks his covenant with Israel and becomes their persecutor instead of their protector. So during the first half of the seven year period, the two witnesses are in Jerusalem, I believe, and one, and no one can harm them. You can read that in, in Revelation 11, and we'll get to that. And then in, in cha next chapter, we're going to be talking about these 144,000 Jewish witnesses. I believe, again, this is my appreciation of how this is working out, that if these two witnesses are in Jerusalem and no one can harm them, that they have, by God's wisdom and power and grace, the knowledge of who belongs to what tribe. I think today it's very difficult to figure out uh, which Jew belongs to, if there are true Israelites, what tribes they belong to, because at AD 70, uh, when the Jerusalem was destroyed, temple destroyed, fire was put on, most of the records that I know were destroyed. But I believe God will send these to, uh, to help identify, because there will be 12,000 that have not known a woman that will be identified, 144,000 witnesses. I don't think it's symbolic, I think it's real. Again, these are just some thoughts that uh, in anticipation of how we go forward, you may want to think about. And so after the midpoint, the rise of the Antichrist as a world leader, the persecutor of the saints really intensifies. And we, re we read that in Matthew 24. For then shall be great tribulation. So I'm, I'm distinguishing between tribulation, which the whole 70, uh, 70th week of Daniel or the seven-year period, is identified as period of tribulation. But I'm distinguishing between tribulation in general and the great tribulation. I believe when he enters the scene as the world leader and as he demands a submission by anyone and to receive the mark or you don't live, you don't have a commerce, and so on and so forth, that the persecution really is going to intensify. And that's where the seven trumpets and seven bowls are going to start also appearing. So there's going to be a lot of chaos in that three and a half years. Uh, it appears that it is Christ who shortens the days of great tribulation. Philipsis is the Greek word for the elect's sake. Christ says it was going to be so bad, so vile, that if God did not, if, if, if the days were not shortened, in other words, only a very limited period of time, that no one would survive this. That's how bad it's, it's going to be. That's what Christ is saying. And these events take place during the second half and definitely uh, are definitely supernatural in type. You know, and that's what I was mentioning as we're going to be studying. You're going to, so you can see a little bit of differentiation between the events of the first three and a half and a second. Uh, many commentators and Christians call the entire seven-year period as tribulation, but uh, like I said, I, I view the second half as the great tribulation. It appears that somewhere in the second half, portion of this period, uh, second half portion, in other words, it doesn't tell us specifically when, the Lord appears in the clouds of heaven with power and glory. So uh, that's the, uh, and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together He's elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. 
So this is a likelihood of one of the understandings of when the rapture takes place. But it's not at the very beginning. I still have some thoughts of that it is beginning, but it's for different reasons. But we'll get to that maybe as I, as I think. But this is one clear place. This is after the three and a half years. Antichrist is in the world power. And he is persecuting the saints. And you submit to him or you're dead. And I believe that somewhere in, in that time, we don't know exactly when, but soon after that, that Christ appears in the clouds in power and glory, and his angels collect his saints. So that's, that's one reference, so keep that in mind. It is very clear from a scripture that we do not know the exact timing of this event. It is during the second half of the seven-year period, but we do not know the day nor the hour. Um, and some of you know, uh, I thought always, well, it's the beginning of the 70th week because we don't know the day or the hour of that. We may see Antichrist appear on the scene, but still the day of the hour or when Christ's going to show up in, in the clouds, we don't know. So we may know the proximity, but we may not know the day. So yeah, it can get a little bit uh, confusing, but I'm just kind of sharing with you what's, what's clearly stated in the scripture. That's at least safe to put your uh, thoughts on it, uh, you can put your foundation on that because that's clearly stated. It's not uh, ambiguous. Uh, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. I believe that after this, uh, this takes place, the day of the Lord or the wrath of God is poured out. These are the trumpets and the bold judgments of God. That's just, again, my understanding because this is the great tribulation because it appears that the Thessalonian group of believers was really eagerly anticipating the return of Christ. But in it, uh, Paul writes to them, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. This is 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2, and then later on 9. For ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so much cometh as a thief in the night. And then in verse 9, he says, for God had not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So the reason I'm mentioning this is I'm trying to differentiate between tribulation, the church, and church is going through tribulation even today. Maybe not here in California. I mean, maybe some psychological tribulation, whatnot. But some parts of the world are definitely suffering persecution and going through tribulation. But the great tribulation, the wrath of God that is going to be poured upon this earth, uh, I believe the church will not experience that. That's just me because this script, the verse says, for God had not appointed us unto wrath because this is the wrath of God now coming upon, upon the earth. Different of, of uh, other maybe uh, things that God is allowing. In 2 Thess Thessalonians 1 to 3, it says uh, in chapter 2, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that she be not soon shaken in mind or Troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for the day shall come, I'm sorry, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Um. So basically, we know that uh, the son of perdition will be identified. We're going to recognize him when the peace treaty is made. But the actual final, uh, that day of wrath, is the, the, the actual outpouring of God's judgment. That day in that seven-year period, we may not know. That's how I'm understanding this scripture. Uh, since the church never knows... When Christ will return, each generation must live in ex expectancy of his coming. Uh, the book of Revelation must be able to communicate truth to each generation, not just the people who will be alive when these events occur. Um, I believe that the, uh, uh, in every era of, of uh, church history, the church has had to contend with Babylon and, and, and Antichrist. But Revelation 6 through 19 is, I believe, the climax of the conflict. In 1 John, we read 2.18. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, 
even now are there many antichrists. So throughout the generations, there were types of antichrists. I mean, think of Hitler, of Stalin, or, or you name it. I mean, there, there have been types of antichrists always. But there will be that the antichrist that is to come, whereby we know that it is the last time. Uh, since neither the rapture nor the church are the subject of Revelation 6.18, many conclude that the rapture of the church takes place before the events uh, beginning in chapter 4, but that's just the, why people use that as a rationale. The most important for us is to be ready and watch therefore. So that was the introduction to general discussion going from 6 to 19, and then we read these first a vision of the first four horsemen. I'm going to try in, uh, to summarize what I think this represents now. Um, so Revelations 6 and 7, John characterized the opening days of the tribulation as a time of retribution, response, and redemption. Uh, today we're just reading the first part of the chapter 6. In this section, uh, John recorded the opening of the first four seals as a each seal is open, he is invited to come. I believe that events take place on earth because of the sovereign direction of God in heaven. It is God, it is Christ that opens the seals and initiates these events. It is not anybody else, even though at times it feels like things are just out of control, out of hand. But we're seeing that it is Christ that opens the seals. He's giving the power. And we see the horses, and the imagery of horses can be compared to that in Zechariah. If you read Zechariah, there's 14 chapters, but that's probably one of the most challenging prophetic books to, to study if you, if, you, if you undertake, because it's got so much uh, of, of imaging and, and explanation of the, of the end times. Uh, but it's not easy to, to follow through. And then, anyway, anyway, Zechariah also used the imagery of horses. Horses represent God's activity on earth, the forces he uses to accomplish his divine purpose. So the horse per se, it's not necessarily uh, a person, or, but it's, it's a type of force that God is going to be using. The center of his program is Israel, particularly the city of Jerusalem. If you read Zechariah, you will see that he uses uh, Jerusalem is mentioned uh, 39 times in the book of Zechariah, the holy city. God has a covenant purpose for Israel, and that purpose will be fulfilled just as he promised. In other words, a lot of the things, but church is still here, and will be experiencing some of these things, but a lot of these things are focused on Israel and Jerusalem. Um, Daniel states that there is a prince that shall come, as we talked about in 927, the future world dictator. He begins uh, as a peacemaker. We see that that's one of his uh, qualities. Some scholars suggest that this first white horse is Christ, is the spread of the gospel. I have a little bit of a difficulty with, with that explanation, accepting it uh, at face value. Uh, there are uh, making reference because in chapter 19, verse 11, he comes on a white horse again. But there is a difference. Uh, this individual on the white horse has a crown that it's called Stephanos crown. This is a victory crown. The one in chapter 19, which is Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, has the diadem, which is the royal uh, crown. No royal crown can be put on, on the Antichrist. That's just my, my thinking. So what I believe is this is really as Antichrist, ant, Antichrist. Is trying to imitate Christ, uh, but pr against Christ, I believe that he. This is that uh, peacemaker in in the beginning of this period. The, I believe that uh, he would resemble the Christ because Antichrist is Satan's uh, great imitation. Uh, the great deceiver will come as a peaceful leader, holding a bow, but no arrows. Our Lord's weapon is the sword; it is His word. Uh, Antichrist will solve the world's problems and be received as the great liberator. That's at least my understanding, because if you read anything about that region of Israel, a small land, small piece of land in the entire world, there's always activity going on and always unrest. 
for someone to come on a world scene to negotiate a peace with surrounding nations, uh, it's got to be someone that obviously has been set this way, but it's going to deceive many. Uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the, uh, the uh, word in this uh, chapter 6, verse 2, Stephanos is the victory crown, and the one in Revelation 19, 12 is the diadem, the kingly crown. Certainly, uh, there is a, a sense in which Jesus Christ is conquering today, and that is he releases people from the bondage of sin and Satan. We can read in the Acts and in Colossians, who had delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Uh, but I believe that this conquest began with his victory on the cross and certainly did not have to wait for the opening of the seal, which I think is really the beginning of the seven-year period. So that's, those are some thoughts that I have why I believe that the white horse and a white horseman represent the Antichrist and his conquest of peace initially as he uh, marches to, towards becoming the world leader at the uh, midpoint of that 70th week. And then, of course, uh, conquest begins in peace, but soon exchanges the empty uh, bow for a sword. Uh, the color red is often uh, associated with uh, terror and death. The red dragon, later on in chapter 12, the red beast in 17, it is a picture of wanton bloodshed. War has been a part of men's experience since Cain killed Abel, so this image would speak to believers in every age. And then that is followed with color black, often connected with famine. Famine and war go together. A shortage of food, it's always part of war and or uh, significant drought. But war is definitely an element that causes a lot of uh, shortage of food. This do not hurt <clears throat> the oil and the wine is interpreted that in essence the average person would be suffering because you would have to work all day long to just have enough food to buy for yourself. Where in a normal times an average person could work all day and maybe feed four to six to eight people. This is just in terms of scale of labor and how much it was paid, you know, when this was recorded. So it was so tough that you barely going to have enough food for yourself. But it says, do not hurt oil and wine. Many scholars interpret that, that the wealthy people will continue to sustain well. And that's almost evident throughout every uh, historic events, every war, whatever, that average person is the one that suffers the most. That doesn't mean that. Wealthier people don't suffer, but most of them uh, fare off better. That's at least one, one interpretation of that. Uh, and uh, in the Old Testament, we also have uh, uh, basically uh, kind of a concept that Jews understood to eat bread by weight meant a time of famine. So you can find uh, examples in Leviticus and so on. So that's the uh, third. And then a death. John saw two personages, if you will, with, with the death, pale horse. On a pale horse in uh, Hades, the realm of dead followed him. Now, Christ said that he has the keys of death and Hades in Revelation 1, 18. And both will one day be cast into hell, Revelation 20. That death claims the body, our physical body, while Hades claims the soul of the dead. You can find that in Revelation 20, 13. And again, those are all the final outcomes uh, of, of these events that take place. So John saw these enemies going forth to claim the prey, armed with weapons of the sword, hunger, pestilence, and wild beasts. In ancient times, hunger, pestilence, and the ravages of beasts would be expected to accompany war. So conquering tyrants who bring the world war, famine, and pestilence are certainly nothing new. Suffering people from the days of the Roman emperor to the most recent war can easily recognize anticipation of these four dreaded horsemen. This is why the book of Revelation has been a source of encouragement to suffering believers throughout history as they see the lamb opening the seals and initiating these. 
they realize that God is in control and that he, his purposes will be accomplished. So my understanding in a summary of these is the, this is a summation of the first three and a half year period of this 70th week. This is kind of preparation where things are going to go in the second three and a half year period. It will start off in a peaceful conquest and, and spreading out, but it will be then involving some wars and that would produce famines and shortage of food and that all associated with these events will also create uh, hunger and death and it says quarter of the population will be affected. So that's my understanding of chapter six and the beginning of these opening. Remember what I said, if for the, uh, for the next phase to really take place, all seven seals have to be peeled off. Then you can open the scroll. So these are the introduction in my mind. And that doesn't mean that they're going to be happening just in some four specific periods uh, of the three and a half year divided, you know, 36 months. And it's going to be nine months each. It's just that they're going to be slowly developing and probably overlapping and continuing. And the influence uh, will be the same. What is key to remember, that it is the Christ who opens these seals. It is the Christ who authorizes the things that have to take place. And our trust and hope is in Christ, the Redeemer. Even perchance that we are in that period and we are present, our assurance is still in God and his promises. For ultimately, we look forward to be with him. I believe that the great, great tribulation we will be spared off, but the rest we will be suffering perhaps with the others. That's how I understand this part of the chapter 6, and we'll continue, Lord willing, next time. May the Lord add a blessing. Number 284, 
we'd be prepared for whatever may come, that we'd be fully in tune with you, in a relationship with you, and be able to overcome any difficulties or obstacles or persecution and tribulation that will come upon us that would be drawn close to you and you would take us through anything we have to go through. And We're grateful for the salvation you've offered us and we pray for those who have not accepted that salvation, that you would work in their hearts and bring them to you, help them to realize that today is the day of grace and the day of opportunity and that they would not spurn that offer, but they would accept your salvation. We are grateful for the food that's been provided and pray that you would bless the food and the people who have prepared it and that we'd be able to glorify you in the rest of today. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. The more I um, listen to the media and hear about the craziness going on around us, the more excited I get because it really seems that this is timely, uh, that the time is now at hand, and the crazier it gets, the quicker the Lord seems to be coming. Uh, but I think the most important thing is, what is your relationship? What is my relationship? And are you on? The winning side. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we indeed praise you and magnify thy name. Uh, we are thankful for the hymns that we have sung and that there is always a hymn to tie the message in. We are very grateful for the fellowship that we share and be with us in our conversations this afternoon as we would fellowship in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 